fact, my connection with Vonnegut, as Ken mentioned, goes back to my days in college. And it will address why I wrote a, a biography of Kurt Vonnegut and what kinds of questions interested me. Go all the way back to 1969. And I'm a freshman in college at the University of Illinois. Uh, in 1968, just the year before, we had the Democratic Convention in Chicago. And I remember watching it on television with uh, young people shouting, the whole world is watching and the police charging the crowds, tear gas, spotlights. I remember my mother turning to me and saying, this country's coming apart. <laughs> so it was in this kind of atmosphere that I went to college in 1969, uh, applied to be a conscientious objector and was refused, was made 1A, was in the first draft lottery. And in the midst of this kind of tension and, and national change comes Kurt Vonnegut. Realize that in 1965, just four years before that, he was out of print. He was considered as something of a sci-fi hack. And in 1969, he rides this tremendous tsunami of popularity. What accounted for it? Well, I'll get to that. But at that time, seeing so many young people read Kurt Vonnegut, um, I wondered even then, what was the appeal? Why, why was he such a phenomenon? And as I learned later, it's something that applies even to the current generation that reads Kurt Vonnegut. Vonnegut catches you on the cusp of young adulthood, and he seems to be talking to you directly in his books. You open up a novel by Vonnegut, and you get a very strong sense of voice. And if you're 18, 19, 20, 21, and you're, the scales are falling from your eyes, and you're beginning to realize that uh, uh, you have to put your own meaning into life, and uh, all the great questions may not be answered yet. What's our relationship to God? Is there a God? Kurt Vonnegut seems to be raising these things in his novels. And as a friend of mine said, I met a gentleman in his 60s, he said, if you're reading Kurt Vonnegut at, you know, when you're 20 or 21, good for you. If you're reading Vonnegut at 50, I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> you really should have some of those good dancers, you know, by now. But, um, that was one of the things I wanted to do in writing a biography of Kurt Vonnegut. I wanted to find out what accounted for this phenomenon. Why, why did he grab, why did the young people embrace him? Because you know, realize that when Vonnegut published Slaughterhouse Five in 1969, he was coming up on 50. The people who were reading him were people his children's age. So he was really not, although he became you know, a counterculture guru and and you know, sort of looking out at you from those posters with a knowing wink. He was not the age of his readership by far. So this phenomenon of Kurt Vonnegut really intrigued me. And of course, being somebody who loves reading and enjoys writing very much, it's my career, I wanted to know what kind of creative effort went into these books. Beyond the printed word, who's the man behind the novels? How much of it was authentic? Uh, how much of it was imposed upon him? And so when I finished my, my book on Harper Lee in 2006, I began casting around for another project. I wanted to get busy on something else. And I used the same criteria that I had used to find Harper Lee. First of all, who's so interesting that I could stay with him or her for years? Because, you know, biography is a long haul. Now, there's going to be days when you turn up a fascinating letter, and there's going to be weeks when you call around and interview people, and yet nothing is forthcoming, nothing very interesting, maybe just anecdotal. Um, I can remember breaking through finally to somebody who was on uh, Harper Lee's door room floor, and I thought, oh, good. And so I began talking to her, what was she like? And, and this person said, well, she was very funny, and she smoked a lot. Uh, it's really <laughs> difficult to build a biography <laughs> around that kind of stuff. You know, and there will be times like that. So, but nevertheless, it has to be very, very interesting. It has to keep you interested the whole time while you're working on it. And secondly, you have to think, since I'm a professional writer, what about the marketability of it? Who's going to walk into a bookstore and say, well, I'll spend $25 on that. I'll spend $30 on that. So I wanted somebody who was popular and yet who was sort of untouched, somebody about whom there had not been a biography yet. That was true in Harper Lee's case, and it turned out to be true in Kurt Vonnegut's case. As a matter of fact, he was a little miffed about the fact that despite having written for over half a century and having 14 books in print, there had never been a full-fledged biography of him. Every book that I came across tended to be a scholarly analysis of his stories, and the first five or six pages would dispense with his life like an afterthought. 
Raised in Indianapolis, World War II veteran, married to a lady named Jane. Now, on the books, nothing, you know, no interpretation of the man. So I thought, well, this is a great opportunity. So what I did was, I wrote him a letter in uh, the summer of 2006, and was just very upfront about my purposes. Um, why play games? You know, I don't have no need to be deceptive. So I just wrote to him and I said, look, I'm, I'm curious why there's never been a biography of you. That's what I do, I'm a biographer, and I know that you have touched three generations now. I think it's about time for a book that looks at your work in totality, both the, you know, the man behind the books and the books themselves. And I sent this off, fingers crossed, and wondered, uh, wondered what the reaction would be. Well, about 10 days later, I received in the mail a very big flat envelope. It was all bundled up with packing tape and everything as if it were a sheet of gold. And I opened it up, and inside was an 11 by 17, a page torn from an artist's pad. You know that heavy kind of rag paper? <coughs> and on it was a big sketch of Kurt Vonnegut that he had done himself. Just sort of mused, you know, looking bemused, looking up. And underneath it said, this is a sketch of me demurring on the offer of the fine biographer Charles Shields to write that biography. <laughs> well, it was cryptic. It was cryptic to say the least. Wasn't a letter, it was a drawing. And we propped it up on the mantelpiece, my wife and I, and we looked at it for a while, and she fastened on the word demurring. Now, Vonnegut is a wordsmith, and you know, he chooses his words very carefully. It wasn't absolutely not, unconditionally no, uh, never in a thousand years, nothing like that. Demurring. I compare it to this. It's like going to Thanksgiving dinner and you offer somebody a second piece of pie and they go, oh, I couldn't possibly. Well, maybe. <laughs> you know, and demurring, same sort of thing. So I wrote him another letter and I decided to tell him more about myself because I found that in getting to know people, particularly in interviewing people, it's very important to share something of yourself. There has to be a spirit of reciprocity between you and the person. Because if you just interview someone cold and they don't know anything about you, you're asking to take something from them. You know, Tell me about your childhood. Tell me about high school. Who are you? Do we have anything in common? So I wrote a letter that was a little biography of me. That I was a Midwesterner, and I pointed out that he was a Midwesterner. I said that my father had been in public relations for Ford Motor Company after the war, and he had been in public relations for General Electric. I said that he had a son, Mark, my age, almost exactly. In fact, I had read Mark's book, The Eden Express, uh, at the time I was hitchhiking out to San Francisco to live in Haight-Ashbury for a while. Um, and then, just by a fluke, I happened to mention that when I was a boy, I had attended Quaker meetings with my, my parents. Little did I know that his wife Jane, his first wife Jane, had been raised as a Quaker in Indianapolis. So fortunately there was an accidental coincidence there. And I wound it up by saying, a little bit of braggadocio here, I said, you know, somebody could probably cobble together a life of you just by trolling the internet and maybe going through your papers at Indiana University. And they could do a passable job. After all, it would be the first one ever. I said, you know, I'm a damn good writer and a good researcher, and I think I'm the guy for the job. I mailed it off to him. About a week later, I got a postcard. I turned it over. It's a little drawing of Kurt smoking. <laughs> and above his head is one word. Okay. <laughs> that was it. I was in. I wrote back one letter in, in 24 printed type. It said, Kulu, Kalei, Mr. Vonnegut said okay. And we we're off and running. And I found out that Kurt Vonnegut was looking forward to a new friendship. Because Kurt Vonnegut was actually an extrovert. Uh, unusual in most writers. Most writers tend to be kind of inward turning, you know? But Kurt in liked people, and he liked social occasions. And a lot of, I think a lot of his energy in his writing came from the fact that he could imagine a reader on the other side enjoying this as much as, as he was in terms of trying to be entertaining, being humorous. Consequently, as soon as I met him, I got the impression of a much older man, 84 years old, who was glad to have a new friend. Imagine the situation. Uh, he had been calling me periodically at night. Uh, my wife and I would be watching a movie, and this is long before I began any formal interviews. The phone would ring, 9.15 at night. 
I'd pick it up, and on the other end was a gravelly voice that said, This is for Bonnie. How's my biography coming? Yeah. <laughs> and he just wanted to talk. He just wanted to talk. And he wanted to reminisce. And certain words would set him off. Ask him a little bit about his childhood in Indianapolis. Oh, he had a lot of opinions about Indianapolis. Ask him about his German American relatives. Oh, there used to be 17 Bonnets in the phone book in Indianapolis. Now there's only two. And this pair of magic words for him were Lake Max and Cucky. Lake Max and Cucky was a spring fed lake, still is, north of Indianapolis. And he and his German-American relatives owned a collection of about five cottages on the eastern shore. And every summer, he would spend these halcyon months jumping into the freshwater lake of Lake Max and Cucky, boating, cooking out, 4th of July fireworks. And if I just mentioned Max and Cucky, you could almost feel him decompress and sort of move back into an earlier period of his life. He could also be quite argumentative. Sometimes Kurt. Uh, would call me up after he had been, as my father used to say, hitting the paint, uh, and, and would call me in a mood for a good contest of some sort. I remember one night a really asinine argument about who was more aggrieved, German Americans or Irish Americans, with him sticking up for the Germans and me sticking up for the Irish. And finally he said, oh, well, you're a nice guy, bam, I'm not. So he never said goodbye. He just, he just said, in fact, I don't ever recall the man saying goodbye. But he sent me postcards and he sent me letters and finally it was